place to be at noon Eastern every Thursday. We have some breaking news to, uh, coming to you live from the Charlotte studio and around the country. Uh, we're going to be talking about the latest DOJ guidance unveiled. Jump in, get your fingers in your uh, mouse or mice is ready and start hitting those emojis. Uh, and let's get it going, guys. Jump in the chat. Tell people where you're from. Drop your LinkedIn and connect because your network is your net worth. And let's bring them both up. Uh, get your phones out. We got some QR codes coming up. Uh, there's also a link on the platform to all of these links in case you miss them. Uh, but please take our ethics verse survey. Feedback is a gift. And if you haven't gifted anybody with some kindness today, then gift us some feedback so we can know how we can serve you better. Uh, coming up next, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the Ethics Verse Learning Hub. So jump in, jump on the website, go to ethico.com, find the Ethics Verse section. We got all of these books in our library that maybe you've won one already. If you haven't, stay tuned. There's one coming, a chance coming up. Some great podcasts that we love and a bunch of ways to up your game and increase uh, your knowledge to help you be a better leader. Uh, moving through this, you can grab the QR code there or grab it in the links. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to the Ethics Verse, you're going to want to subscribe to this podcast. This is the best podcast in the Ethics Verse that's run by me and or Nick about ethics. So if that's your criteria, this is at the top of that list. Check out the latest episode by Jade Smith. Uh, FCPA Survival Guide, if you haven't heard, it's winning lots of, of awards. The W3 award was um, given to this podcast and the uh, the written guide to go along with it. Check it out. Nick's on it. Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, is on it. Um, and up your game with that one. Uh, just so you know, a lot of people are getting kind of 1.6 reports per 100 people in their Speak Up program. And actually, employees are six to eight times more likely to give those reports to their manager than they are to the compliance department. So we're all working on our branding. We're working on engaging with, uh, you know, our leaders and getting that tone at the top, but the mood at the middle, engaging your middle managers is what really can transform your program, help you engage and build allies uh, across the organization and help those advocates at the middle manager level really drive this into your culture. So check out our uh, middle managers toolkit. We spoke on this at a symposium a week or two ago and uh, it, uh, the things that are in here, there's some teaching in it. There's a white paper in it, but there's a bunch of things for you to just download, customize, and launch. So you have a, not so much work to do that can really change your program. Uh, come on over to Ethico. Check out the ecosystem. People love us on G2 Crowd. People love us uh, as a way to get analytics out of their program, dr drive a speak up culture, and help their team be more efficient to uh, drive risk and insight. Um, and as always on the Ethics Verse, we love learning and we love your work. So we're going to be giving away five of these books today uh, on managing technology and communications. C culture is communication and compliance is culture. So you got to get the communications right. Five of these coming at you today. Want to give you another shot to hit this QR code if you want, or you can get it in, uh, in the platform. Five books coming at you because we love you that much. Uh, check out Hema's new po uh, podcast, Unless. Uh, you've seen her on uh, the Gwick podcast. You've seen her all around. She's a great thought leader, really compelling insights. And this podcast is one not to be missed. Get it on Spotify. Get it wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you got to check that out. The SMQ shop, I am lo I'm loving this thing more and more. We just got some swag at the office here. People are loving it. We're handing it out, giving it out as prizes, sharing it with our team. Uh, some great, you know, compliance and ethics uh, stickers and uh, pins and patches and, and uh, T-shirts and stuff like that. Check out the merch and let's uh, fly our flag as compliance and ethics experts. Um, check out the Ideation Station Culture Builders Network. Uh, join this network on LinkedIn and find other people that are trying to bring up, come up with ideas to build their culture um, and network with other people who are like-minded. Um, just a heads up, there's a job opening as director and head of privacy at Cyan Health. This is where Mary Shirley is. You got to know her book, Level Up, by now. It's wonderful. A lot of people have leveled up because uh, Mary, Mary Shirley was willing to share her genius on this. And here at Ethico, you know, we love you. You know, we want you to love your work. So we're giving people up to one free year on any new service because there's a lot that goes into changing a system and doing integrations and overlapping your service and stuff like that. We know that when people come here, they do a great job. They love it and they want to stay. And we'll take the first year on us up to a year free on any new service. So check it out. Come over to Ethico. Uh, we're doing great things with people like you over here every day. Um, and uh, the up. Uh, coming up on November 6th is the next installment of the Seven Elements Book Club. 
get the Gmail at the bottom uh, email to join this book club. Ellen runs the, this club with a bunch of people who are voracious learners and do some of that through reading. Join this club. It's a great way to engage with other people and learn. Uh, and speaking of learning, we're going to get right into it here. Uh, today on the Ethics Verse, as we mentioned, we're going to be talking about the uh, updated DOJ guidance. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's trying to figure out what does this mean for next year? What does this mean for, uh, you know, regulation and enforcement? And what does this mean for how I need to be changing my program and making my plan for the next one quarter, the next one year, the next three years? So uh, I, I can really serve my team and my mission the best. So as always, we got Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance coming to us. If you're not subscribed to Radical Compliance, you got to check it out. You get, uh, you know, his greatest thoughts in musings and reflections. Uh, um, constantly coming out from Matt. Uh, welcome to the show, Matt. Glad you're here. Thank you very much, Gio. Good, glad to be here. And we have a lot of ground to cover. And thank you for all of the uh, attendees who are listening and chatting away there. Uh, we have some great speakers to talk about the new Justice Department guidelines on what an effective compliance program should be. Uh, first up is Ellen Hunt, who is a longtime voice of wisdom in the ethics and compliance field who ran the compliance and audit functions at the AARP for a long time and also these days is at Spark Consulting, working with a bunch of other compliance uh, companies on their compliance needs. So, uh, Ellen, welcome. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks, Matt. And also joining us is Mike Ward. So Mike these days is a partner at Baker Botts uh, Law Firm. However, Mike in his past has also been Chief Compliance Officer at a big tech company that went through an FCPA resolution very favorably and a former federal prosecutor himself. So Mike also has a lot of experience about how companies should be dealing with the Justice Department and what a good compliance program is. Uh, Mike, thanks for being here today. Well, thank you. And uh, I wish everyone on the on the call uh, some good questions. Uh, this is the best audience, I think, in in compliance uh, seminars, and I'm uh, anxious for the conversation. Well, we appreciate that. And so, yes, anybody who is listening in, if you do have questions about what the guidance has said uh, or what you think mm -hmm. we should do about interpreting the guidance, we'd love to hear your questions. You can pop them into the attendee chat at any time. Uh, you can pop them into the Q&A function. We will take the questions as they come, or if we gloss over them, we'll keep them in reserve and get to them and go through them probably in the last 10 minutes or so uh, of the hour. But that's what we're looking to do. So I wanted to start by asking, I guess maybe Ellen first and then Mike, um, what would you recommend the listeners to do? How, how should they think about these guidelines? because a lot of people see them as a punch list of, you must have all of these things done, you must have an answer for every single question. I'm not necessarily sure that is the right way to think about it, but um, Ellen first and then Mike and then Gio, you know, what would your advice be about how compliance officers should even just think about these guidelines before we get into the update? Yeah. So I, I, thinking about this, I think we get very focused on what's changed. And, you know, a lot hasn't. And one of the things that I think is really important is the framework that they set out for us, which is those three important questions. Right. Is your program well designed? Is it fairly administered? And does it work? And we know that all of the elements fit into those three questions. But I think you should look at it from that framework. And then you should think about the new uh, additions and how do they apply to your industry? Do they make sense for you? Are you actually using AI in a way that you might commit a crime? If not, I'm not sure that that's all that relevant to you. Uh, and so I think you should really think about it, how it applies to you and understand the context in which these guidance is, is used, which is you're in the middle of an investigation and a prosecutor is figuring out whether they should charge you, maybe hopefully not at all, you get a declination, right? Or what, what's the extent of the penalty? So it's always going to be in context of the, the crime that they think you've committed. Uh, and I think you should look through it through that lens. Mike, what would you say? Yeah, I agree with everything that, that Alan said. Um, you know, every time that these, these uh, ECCP amendments come out, I'm a little bit 
excited to see like what's in there. But I also have a lot of dread because I know there's a lot of overreaction to to what's in the document. And it's for just the reason you said, Matt, that there's a bit of a, I think, recalibrating that we need to do every time they come out to point out what they're what they're intended to do and what they should be used for both by prosecutors and by, by compliance officers. And that every time they come out, I, I, I look back at some of my posts on, on, on these issues and I, I find that I often say a similar thing, which is what's most recent is not necessarily or usually what's most important. So as Ellen says, we take the time to look at what's new but almost invariably, in, in all of the history of these evolutions, the most important is not what has changed, but is what at its is is at its core. And I, there there are a couple of reasons for that, and there are a couple of reasons for why people kind of misapprehend what they should be doing with this document. As you said, Matt, a lot of people think of it as a punch list. It is not. And what but we mean by that is like if you answer no to one or maybe even dozens of questions, it is not a path to getting the effective compliance program merit badge. Like you can have a very effective compliance program while answering no to a number of these questions. In fact, it's interesting that we call them questions because grammatically we don't, they're, they're either declarative statements or there's questions, right? These are actually what I would think more fairly described as considerations. Do you do this? And is it right for your organization, as Ellen alluded to? And if you do, if you do maybe something different, that may be a, a proper approach for you. Uh, but these are things that you should think about in, mm -hmm. in structuring your program. And that's kind of where you need to go. I would also say, even maybe I disagree a bit with, with Ellen on this, like, I don't even know that this document is any longer a good organizational roadmap for how to build a, an effective compliance program. And I, I think it's, I'm a big fan of the fact that we have this and that there's transparency from the department about what they are asking about. Uh, but I like to think about, like I, I was a prosecutor, as you said, for 16 years, and I was very confident in my opinion, and I would lecture companies and wag my finger at them about how terrible their compliance program was. And then I became a compliance officer, mm -hmm. and I quickly figured out what I didn't know then, and there was a little bit of uh, humility involved in that process. Prosecutors are what I would consider sommeliers. They can tell you that this wine tastes good and you know the result of the effort. But compliance officer is a winemaker. And what a winemaker knows about how to 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 uh, to create or turn out a, a good wine. Remember I'm in Northern California. This is a good analogy for me. The the sommelier will not know a million of those things that the winemaker has to do in order to turn out that wine. Mm -hmm. And so they're different perspectives. And you need to remember that you as a compliance officer know more about how to create an effective compliance program than somebody who's never done that job before ever will. So have faith and have confidence in what you're doing. What this ECC document is, is valuable because it gives us a window into something that's really important. And that is the prosecutorial discretion process. When a prosecutor is evaluating, investigating a company, they have a couple of questions to ask. And one is, you know, did this company violate the law? Can I prove it? But lots of companies don't get prosecuted, even though the evidence is sufficient to, to charge them. And that's because of this prosecutorial discussion issue. Prosecutors decide, is it the right thing to do to charge this company? And most of the white collar space is about trying to convince prosecutors that you don't need to prosecute this company. And just like I didn't really understand everything about a compliance program when I was a prosecutor, this document is helpful to bring prosecutors along the path of these are some of the questions that they should ask to figure out if this company was in good faith trying to get it right. So, And, and I think that's the way to think about it as part of that process. And the the... the I mean, I, I don't want to keep going on this, Matt. I know you've got a question, but like, there are some things that you can and should do to influence that 
that aren't necessarily prescribed in this document. They start, there's hints of that, but I would just stop by saying this, Matt. All of these things are not equal. There are some that are really vitally important in running an effective compliance program, and also some that are much more effective in persuading a prosecutor that you were acting in good faith and you had evidence to back up your understanding that things were working right. If you only have a pile of policies to say we were you know, good people and we were acting in good faith, that's far less effective than having a bunch of testing of your controls that you can marshal as evidence to the prosecutor and say, look, we put all of these controls in place and we were regularly scrutinizing to find out whether they were working properly and we had reliable evidence that they were. Now, there may have been a loophole that we have now closed, but we, we did, in fact, put in the effort to get this right. And that's, the, that's, that's what is persuasive to a prosecutor. Let, let me pause there. And, Gio, I don't know if, if you have any thoughts here, but, you know, I'm also struck that on one hand, we do always fuss about what's the latest thing that's in this guidance. And that, that's half the reason why we have this session here today. But I am struck by Mike and Ellen's points that still there's a lot of basic fundamentals that are what really matters. And so long as you can show you're thoughtful about what your risks are and you are making what you think is the best effort, you're going to be on a start on a good foot with DOJ. But Gio, what do you think stands out here from what you've been listening to? Yeah, I think it's a great point. And, um, you know, I think that that this is what each of us should rest in and count on is that the the ways that you've built your career and invested in what you need to know and built relationships around your organization are going to be a much stronger driver of what you should do this month and over the next year than necessarily this DOJ guidance. And I love the illustration, Mike, of, you know, a winemaker versus a sommelier. Uh, because we as ethics experts need to decide what kind of wine we need to make over the next few months. If you're just in a new organization that has hardly anything uh, by way of compliance, you might need to get a three buck chuck spun up in the next three months and just kind of get some of that going because that's the best way to do this. And then you're going to escalate over time versus, you know, if you're, you know, super well established and all these risks are managed and you want to kind of look out and say, hey, where should I be a, in a year or two? I tend to think that this DOJ guidance generally, and especially looking at lat, you know, the last version versus this one, is helping us look a little bit further into the future. I think they're giving some hints and saying, right, because this is not a rubric, this is not like marching orders. They're saying, hey, we're going to start paying attention to more of these things as we go. And, you know, I think if we get into it, we'll see that they're looking for more measurement. They're saying, hey, you know, you should think about, you know, are you looking at your peers and seeing how they're they're using and learning from uh, advanced technology and things like that, which you may not be getting to in, you know, even the next year if you need to still put fundamental things in place. So I think it's great to use this to help think about, hey, you know, where are the ongoing, you know, how is the target moving? How, you know, how is best in class becoming more advanced than it was before? But it's up to you as the leader, as the ethics expert to jump in and say, hey, that's great that, you know, at some point I maybe need an, uh, you know, an AI compliance compliance monitoring risk assessment or something, but that's not what we have right now. The next thing we need right now is to go deeper in this area that, we were, that we're already in. So I wanted to talk a bit about some of the specific new issues that the guidance has raised in this latest edition, which came out a couple of weeks ago now. Um, one was a lot of talk about the whistleblowing culture in your organization, how you're training the employees on what their whistleblowing options are, but also even just how the company assesses employees' willingness to report misconduct. In fact, I think that's an actual question from the guidance is, how does the company assess employees' willingness to report misconduct? Ellen, let me start with you. How is the compliance officer supposed to think about these new issues? Like, how do you go about assessing employees' attitudes or appetite for reporting? What else jumps out at you about, I don't know, changes to the internal reporting program that a compliance officer might want to keep in mind or what the department is or could ask about? Like, what stands out to you here? 
Uh, well, a couple things. The DOJ always cares about whistleblowers, right? Front and center, because that's where they get their best tips. And of course, they're hoping for a bunch more with their new award program. But I mm -hmm. think there's a couple things you can do. And the one thing I would suggest you don't do is rely on a question in the employee engagement survey that says, if you saw misconduct, would you report it? Because everybody's going to check yes to that question. Here are things that I think you can do. Uh, look and do a, a kind of, you know, secret shopping or mystery shopper on your own hotline. How difficult and complicated is it to actually file a concern? Do I have to go mm -hmm. through a list of 30 different issue types and pick one to figure out what type of concern I have with not knowing what's the difference between an accounting irregularity and a financial misstatement? I don't know what those things are. Why would I? Does it, do you ask me a whole bunch of demographic questions before I can even tell you what I'm most concerned about? The more barriers you put, and this gets to the question about, are you chilling? Are you chilling the process? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the worse it's gonna be. I think the other thing that I think people don't do that I think can really help get to the core of this question is, and what was your experience like? When you went through this, were you treated fairly? Were you treated with respect? And the question that I would like people to think about asking is kind of developing a net uh, promoter score, would you recommend to a friend and a coworker to report? Because after all, that's an endorsement. And so I, th I think there's a lot of things we can do here to, to get an assessment. One of the things I reported to my board was the ratio of the number of questions asked versus concerns. I want people come talk to me about what they're planning on doing, not come talk to me after they've already done it. Mm -hmm. And that is a willingness to report. If you're willing to ask a question and have an honest dialogue about what your plans are, that tells you a lot about the culture. Okay, so now, Mike, let me ask you the same questions. And I'll first say I was really struck by Ellen's comments that there are a lot of very practical nuts and bolts things that could incentivize or distract or complicate a whistleblower's appetite in the company. Because I had originally read those, and I'm thinking like the pie in the sky ephemeral messaging from the CEOs and the managers that we always want you to talk. And we we're very, uh, very interested in a speak up culture. But that's not the same as, you know, Ellen's points about do you have an easy system to use, which Maybe that's going to be more important to incentivize the culture. But when you're looking at these issues and what would you recommend a compliance officer try and think through to make sure the the internal speak up culture is where you want it to be? Yeah, I, I think there are a, a wide range of both direct and indirect indicators of, of, of this behavior. And so you need to think, you know, expansively ab about it. Um, so. Uh, and, and I think it also brings up an, an important thing, not just relevant to, to whistleblower risk management, but when we talk about the term incentive or disincentive, I think too often people think about economic incentives and whether there's a reward or a penalty attached with the behavior. And Ellen's comment really points out that, and, and what I've seen in most my experience, that when I think about incentives or disincentives, I think about organizational friction. Is it easier or harder to do things the right way versus the wrong way. And these are these are really kind of revealed by kind of tracing a process and trying to figure out like, you know, is, is it impossible to get approval for to do something? Do you have to like bother the EVP of your department to do that? People don't wanna be asking their EVP for, you know, can I take a customer to this game? And so are you in fact incentivizing people that way to you know, do things without getting approval because you've created a pre-approval process that is unrealistic and and, and in 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 way in a way encourages you know non-compliance. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's a, that's an important takeaway here about just the the idea of incentives. Um, I think on the on the retaliation of the whistleblower thing, I've put in place um, practices like look back reviews. Like if you take a look at all of your your cooperating witnesses, well, it's not just limited to whistleblowers, but even people who who cooperated in the course of an internal investigation, go back two years later, are they still with the company? Um, go back at the end of the investigation, have you experienced any you know, adverse impact as a result of this? You can accumulate and track that kind of results to be an indicator of whether you're effective at protecting those 
those whistleblowers. And then um, I disagree with Helen, or with, excuse me, with Ellen about the use of the survey data. I am a huge proponent of diagnostic surveys. Um, I've been in organizations where people are trained to just give the answer that they know that they should, and that's that's a problem, and it's it's a problem that needs to be solved. But I don't think I throw out the survey as a tool because I have a culture that where people are, in fact, that's evidence that they're not they don't feel free to speak up. Mm-hmm. And I have had organizations where, in these anonymous surveys, <clears throat> by the way, I think you know that's an that's an important issue. In a lot of all employee surveys, your anonymity is really not assured. Everybody knows who you are because there's all these reporting chains where like everybody who reports to Matt, you know, Matt gets a report of what their answers were as a group. So maybe there's 12 direct reports to Matt. He gets to see that one of them said, no, I don't trust my my manager. Like that's career suicide. I've, I've had those kinds of reporting relationships yeah. where I'm like, oh, I can't answer this question or or he's going to be upset with me. Um, but if you have a truly anonymous survey where people can answer that question without fear that it's going to come back to them, then I think those survey tools can be very powerful. And not just on this question of, do you feel free to speak up without fear of retaliation? You can use survey tools to figure out, as you and uh, as you were saying at the outset, where are our reports going? Are they going to the whistleblower line? Are they going to managers? Are they going to internal audit? I've used surveys to kind of gather information from people. Did you observe conduct or misconduct that you any perceived misconduct in the organization? If so, what kind? Did you report it? If so, where? And this allows you to map these kind of information flows and you can find out then, wow, a lot of our reports are apparently going to, you know, the cafeteria. Somebody thinks that the cook in the cafeteria can solve this problem. Like, I need to go close that loop and make sure that those reports are at least getting forwarded to me so I have visibility. But I think there are a great variety of things you can do to measure this. And I think, contrary maybe to Ellen, I like surveys. I think they're really powerful at measuring um, a lot of employee attitudes and I've even used them to measure employee awareness and understanding of key policy requirements. Um, and that allows you to target remedial training to a specific area instead of torturing the whole company with like, oh, it's time for everyone to learn about conflicts of interest. You know, Singapore reports that they don't understand conflicts of interest. Let's just Singapore to be retrained on that. Um, I like, I like the two, these surveys for a lot of those purposes. So, uh, Gio, give me your thoughts about, um, oh, yeah. Let let me add one more thing on the the substance of the change. I thought the interesting tweak in their report that that I perceived is they seem to be encouraging or expecting training of employees to report their issues externally. And for a long time, okay, I'm sorry, we can talk about it later. That's fine. But, uh, Gio, I just wanted to see if you could have g- give us any other advice about, you know, to both of Ellen and Mike's points, that there's an awful lot of assessment of employees' attitudes and willingness to sort of, I guess, drink the Kool-Aid or embrace the spirit of ethics and compliance and speaking up. And that can be hard to do. So, Gio, if you were just kind of spitballing what you wanted to do or recommend, what would what would you try and say here? Yeah, first of all, uh, I appreciate the uh, healthy discussion here. I think we get better and we learn more and we understand nuance when we can uh, respectfully debate this. Um, And I think there are merits to both sides of it. I think that if you have one measure and one thing that you look at and you assume that everyone's honest and you just count on that, then you're going to miss a lot of things, right? Like if you, you know, if you look at how scientists do studies or how statisticians look at things, you always have to look at the countervailing variable, right? Like, hey, we got a bunch of positive feedback, but how many people didn't answer? Might those be Mm -hmm. all the people that would be detractors on the NPS survey or whatever it is? Um, and to Mike's point, there's a lot that you can learn from those surveys, but, um, you know, I think we, we need to be careful to not rely on them too much. And you know what, at the end of the day, that sounds to me like job security. That sounds like we need leaders of our compliance and ethics programs to be figuring these things out and saying, Hey, okay, that's pretty good. But what I want to do is not do that survey more frequently. I want to do a different type of survey, or I want to do round tables with managers or whatever it is. Um, and I think that, you know, what, all of these things are to me are journeys, 
right? Like if you look at your physical health, you can look at your cardiovascular health and your diet and how active you are and all of those different things. And the health of your program is that same way. And what what we need to do in looking at this guidance is not say, okay, well, let's throw everything out and let me match everything to like the word count in the DOJ guidance, of course. But we need to say, hey, where do I think I might have a blind spot? And I think that part of um, the way to do that is to try to have a diversity of efforts that don't increase like your budget or your workload too much. And that's why the, you know, the people you partner with, getting great advisors uh, on your team, you know, uh, like uh, both of our guests today, uh, getting great people in your network to help you figure out what different ways to do things and making sure that your technology vendors are partners with you. Because a bunch of things that we've been talking about today can be done through software. There are things that we do for post-call surveys uh, on our hotline or, you know, internally we use software to pull our employees anonymously and allow them report anonymously and report some other things in an identified fashion for our internal compliance program. Uh, and there are also a bunch of things to do related to that sentiment that that cycle through your program. Mike was mentioning, you know, looking back and seeing if people who reported are here several years later, what we encourage people to do is use our task follow-up or corrective action plan module to for, you know, you know, maybe four substantial ones or all of them set a feedback loop to say, hey, one, three, six months later, I'm going to check back with this employee and say, hey, is everything still going OK? You know, if we knew that there was retaliation, we would have done something. We're not seeing anything. Do you perceive that? And even driving that perception directly to a you know whistleblower or someone who cooperates in an investigation and also driving that through your managers through the use of a separate proxy form or um, you know related to a question we have here about inquiries using your technology to scale your presence and to identify these things is going to give you that richness of a view of what's going on because we can't just use one survey one time of year with you know one set of questions and assume that that gets uh, gets us what we need. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of tie that into a question, um, that, uh, came through on the chat saying, uh, I think this was in regard to Ellen of how you, uh, tracked those questions that people asked. I think you, you said that you reported to, you know, the exec team, uh, the proportion of questions versus reports. And did you just do that as one of your, you know, 500 case types, uh, in, uh as it came in, or was that its own kind of path that people sent in questions through? We did it as a separate path because we wanted the hotline to really be something for reporting concerns. But we used Q&A Maker um, to log all of the questions. We had a um, operating procedure that we responded to people within 24 hours, business hours, um, to their questions. And um, by doing that, we knew how many questions. We also knew what our response time was. And then we were able to... Uh, create a, a chat bot to answer those frequently asked questions as well. So people could get answers faster and sooner to some of those common questions. Um, I just want to say one thing on this is that speak up doesn't mean anything if there isn't listen up and activity, meaningful yep. activity behind it. Right. And we get really focused on getting people to tell us the problem, but we don't get focused on solving the problem. Yeah, I mean, the best way to uh, to get people to speak up, in my opinion, is to build champions of people who did it before. And obviously, that's a flywheel that you have to get going. But you you can make great posters and send around great memes and all of that and get get some people to dip their toe into the water the first time. But if they never hear anything back and nothing ever gets done and it feels like this is, uh, you know, a comment box that goes to nowhere, uh, then no amount of great communication strategy is going to do that. And that's part of what, you know, the DOJ is not going to tell us exactly how to do that. That's going to differ based on do you have a bunch of people in the field or do you have, you know, uh, you know, uh, technology natives who are really comfortable using different online forums and chat bots and things like that. You need to figure out how to engage with your culture to build your culture. And uh, that's why, you know, that's why that's why we're here. That's why we need to keep learning. Um, because there are different ways to do that. But it's a great it's a great point, Ellen. You need that cycle because that cycle is what's go going to build momentum so that, you know, listen, it, in my opinion, people are probably going to talk to a peer before they talk to compliance. And like we said earlier, six to eight times more likely to talk to a manager before they talk to compliance. And if there are some other nodes in this network where they go to them and say, ah, I don't know what to do about this. And someone's like, well, I didn't, but I have a friend who reported and she said like, it was good. They were respectful. They were professional, no bad outcome. So you should probably do it. 
And then they go to their manager and say, hey, I'm still feeling a little skittish. And their manager says, hey, you know what? Our compliance team set up a proxy form that I can fill out for you. Let me submit this for you and keep you a little shielded from it. Like you can go to them directly and I encourage you to do it. But also I can do it because what's good for all of us is reporting this stuff. If you have those different ways, then as people go through these different stages, right? If someone's a champion and they fully trust you, then they're going to you know, tell you tell it to you all the time. But if that's not 85% of your uh, employee base all fully trust compliance, if they are, let me know. I'd love to learn from you. But if it's not that, you got to give them a few different routes and you got to make sure that you have that feedback cycle. And to circle back to the DOJ guidance, that's going to answer a bunch of these questions, right? They're starting to say, well, how do you know that people are comfortable? How are you assessing whether this policy is effective and things like that? And you can show them, well, we're not just relying on one thing. And then you can you know, also have good answers to these questions or statements in here. Yeah, but it's, so, and it's, I mean, the measurement is critical, but when you're thinking about that presentation, and, and by the way, I would say, you know, you should spend 75% of your time thinking about what's going to make my program more effective and a, a very small proportion thinking about, like, how am I going to get out of trouble when it, when it happens? Because these mm -hmm. things are very uh, hard to, to, to anticipate with specificity. But let's say you're going to have a, an, a retaliation issue. Someone in your company has retaliated against somebody for making a report. The prosecutor is going to ask you, what were you doing to protect uh, whistleblowers or people who cooperate in investigation? And so you need to think today, you know, that tree that we planted down for shade tomorrow, what would I like to be able to tell them? Is it reasonable to say, well, and I always think about this research that I heard years ago from Pat Harnett in the ECI group, that most retaliation happens immediately. We like to think that like, everyone's going to wait until the end of the investigation and there's some discipline and then like, OK, now the retaliation will start. Now it's retaliation season. It's not the way it is. It happens immediately. So your protections need to go in place immediately. You need to talk to the managers because very often managers will engage in retaliatory conduct unwittingly. Like, well, I'm going to separate Matt and Ellen. And Ellen's going to go off and do this job now so that she doesn't have to deal with Matt, who she just reported on this issue. It's like, you know, you've just retaliated against Ellen. So, you know, your investigator in your investigative protocols, you need to say, look, prosecutors, here's the way we approach an issue. We talk to the manager right away. And here's evidence that we do that consistently. Here's data. Here's the record showing that we do this. Like, these are all indicators. It's evidence that a prosecutor would say, wow, they were thoughtful about this risk how it happens, and they put in place procedures that were well tailored to address the risk. And here's evidence that they followed through. Now, I'd like to have evidence that it was working too, and I like surveys, but there are other ways you can measure that indirectly. But think about all this as, what do I want to put in that PowerPoint deck, you know, using this forward-looking hindsight? What will I wish I had when, when that day comes? You can't prepare, you know, you can't create this evidence then, you can only plant that tree today and have it create that shade for the future. So in the interest of time, I wanted to move on to the next big issue with the Justice Department guidance, which was artificial intelligence. They did add a whole new section to their guidance talking about, broadly speaking, how is a company thinking through its use of AI that might introduce new compliance risks? Also, if there is AI enhanced fraud out there, how are you thinking about that? And how are you elevating your internal controls to push back against AI driven fraud? So on one hand, I think this is important and compliance officers and anti-fraud teams need to think about it. On the other hand, I also am wondering, you could have taken the questions and material from AI and dropped in the words spreadsheets and read that out loud in 1992 and it would have been just as relevant then because it's more like, are you thinking about how this new thing might upend your compliance risks and your fraud risks and everything else? And please make sure that you are thinking about the new thing. Today it's AI, 30 years ago it was spreadsheets, 30 years from now it'll be something else. So I'm not exactly sure how I'm supposed, how much am I supposed to panic about the new AI material? Um, Ellen, I'll start with you and then Mike. Where are we on the panic meter with this uh, issue? Don't panic. Don't panic. Okay. It doesn't make you make good choices. So <laughs> take a breath, slow down. And I think you really need to think about, are you the perpetrator? Are you the victim? Because mm -hmm. I don't think the DOJ is making this clear 
right? And I think they want you to report if you're the victim, and why wouldn't you, right? And we know that you know companies are being victimized by recruiters uh, who are falsely promising people jobs. We, you know, a kind of a deep fake recruiting process. We know about laptop farms and things like that. But then are you the perpetrator? In what ways could your business utilize AI to perpetrate a crime? Is it possible? I think that's where you have to start with the risk. Does the risk exist? And if it does, then how high is it? And what can you do about it? So I think it depends upon, of course, your industry, right? And what what your company does. Um, But I wouldn't panic because I think it is going to be very specific to why you're in front of the DOJ in the first place, which may have nothing to do with AI at all. Mm -hmm. Should you be knowledgeable? Should you be thinking about it? Of course you should, because it is a new way that we are doing business and business is getting done. So of course you should. But I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't panic about it. And I think you should be thoughtful, very thoughtful about it. And, and I think there's, there's really kind of two aspects to how the DOJ is looking at this, what you're doing internally and what's happening to you externally because of the use of AI. Well, I would think, uh, Carl, I think you raised an important point about is somebody using AI to commit a crime? think about that. And that's what the Justice Department is supposed to think about. We should also remember companies could very clumsily use AI to violate a whole bunch of other civil regulatory regimes. And you might have a whole lot of conversations with the Federal Trade Commission or state attorneys general about consumer protection stuff. I could see that. But that's not the same as did you commit a crime that the DOJ is now going to be staring sternly at you? And I think that's an excellent point to call out. Mike, what would you say about all of this and where are we supposed to come down on how much attention to give to AI specifically? Yeah, I think your your recognition of kind of where they are is, is very accurate. They're thinking about it right now as an enabler of other offenses. They're not, or at least these comments do not articulate the way to think about AI as its own substantive risk, and it, and it is one, but it's a much bigger subject. I, I think there's a, let, let, me, let me reframe this also a bit in the sense of, there's a little bit of reality here, and then there's, then, then there's the substance. The reality is that they're not yet mature enough in their thinking about the AI risk to provide a very comprehensive uh, perspective on the nature of that risk. And that's fine because it's a really fast moving area. And I like the fact that they're not asserting perspectives that wouldn't necessarily be supported by where things get to tomorrow or the next day. It's a fast moving area. I I don't want them to be jumping out too far ahead of what we know. In Lisa Monaco's speeches at the ABA and at Cambridge and um, the comments uh, DOJ at SCCE. I did a panel with Lisa Miller two weeks ago. They are clearly thinking about this as an enabling tool to commit crimes. And I'm kind of curious, and I find it just interesting, like they seem to think that it's a a worse crime if you use AI than if you use to create, say, for example, a fake invoice than if you create or use it with Photoshop or as you say, like our spreadsheets. Like I'm not sure that this technology aggravator view that they have is necessarily one I would agree with or, or constructive. But it is really important to be thinking about AI. And as Ellen says, for some businesses, this is critical. For example, I have clients who are involved in, you know, know your customer base, you know, money laundering controls. And there's a lot of online identification and verification of employees. It, the development of generative AI has dramatically changed the ways in which we think about the effectiveness of online identity verification. It's, it's mm-hmm. just so easy now to to create a, these these facial recognition uh, tools and, and and the ways that you can circ- circumvent them. So I think it's brilliant. You need to think about how generative AI and AI, AI in general ha- can really change how you, the effectiveness of your controls. But this is not, these are good questions. 
they're not the roadmap to AI compliance. And if anyone, this is another reinforcement of the notion, like these are considerations. If you, if you follow this roadmap, you will not have achieved compliance with a wide range of AI related risks, but it's a great start to be thinking about AI risks. And it's just a reality that they were not gonna publish updates without a lot of mentions of AI. Well, yeah, it's a great point, Mike. We can't rely, uh, you know, you, you're not going to be able to uh, be in, you know, a suit or a conversation with the DOJ and just say, yeah, I just did whatever they said in the DOJ guidance. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to be covering everything they say in here, especially if it's not a part of your business. Uh, but you also you might need to go well beyond this. And, you know, I, I tend to see this discussion of AI as, you know, directional. Right. And you know that they're going to be looking at this. Um, and I think there's a great chance for us to get ahead of that. To Matt's point, there have been dozens of transformative technologies in the workplace that are now part and parcel to the workplace and our compliance programs, right? Fax machines had a different way of exposing data, right? That sheet could be sitting somewhere and you have to think about that versus, uh, you know, in-person meetings. And then there was email and then there are websites. And like, I'm sure all of us have thought about, well, what is social media doing to expose our data, right? So I would encourage you to Ellen's point, don't panic. You've been here before. You've been part of something where something creeps up and we had BYOD, bring your bring your own device. Um, and, you know, and we've learned to deal with that. And I think there's a great chance to get ahead of that because so much of, of this is guidance and it's contextual. And if you can set something up in the next two months, three months by the end of the year or next year to think through the pillars of your program and make sure that you've at least thought through this and say, hey, you know what? I probably, you know, may, maybe you land here. I probably don't need to do in-depth training on large language models and how people handle data for uh, for this. I don't need to like take a bunch of training throughout the company, but let me just put a toehold and I'm going to have a policy that says this is the approved AI instance or we want everyone to be aware that what you put into an AI model, you know, should be secure or whatever it is, you know, look at your policy, your assessment, your training, look at these pillars of your program and see if you should get started with something because that's going to help you later. Next year, when you review your program, you're going to say, oh, yeah, I've actually learned a lot about how people in sales and marketing or in manufacturing or in this part of my technology team are using AI. Let's step that up. And there's a great chance for you to get started on this and make it part of your program. It doesn't need to be 60% of what you focus on over the next year, but make it part of your program if you think you have decent exposure. If not, then don't spend 18 hours over the next three months learning about AI when it's nowhere in your organization, when you could be building a better speak up culture or having more thoughtful collection of data. You know, it's funny, I'm looking through some of the comments here and uh, one of the attendees pointed out that there's a lot of industry specific risks around using AI and that I do get. Um, so that's one area where I wonder, does compliance need to be involved in not necessarily worrying about what the DOJ might say, but what other regulators might say, yet again, demonstrating, do we have our head in the game? Are we paying attention to this new thing so that people aren't violating the GDPR by dumping two tons of personal data into a chat GPT type of function. Um, I'm also curious though, I think there's a blind spot a bit about AI driven fraud risks, which I think is real, but I don't know that it is the compliance officer's job to address it so much as maybe print out the guidance and staple it to the internal auditor's forehead. Cause it's, kind of their job. They're in charge of fraud controls. Um, what? How should we be thinking about uh, our role in that? Like the external ones using AI against us, does compliance just uh, get that conversation started? Do they play a greater role? What if nobody is doing anything to think about that? Then what kind of position is the company in? Um, Ellen, what would you say? And, and then Mike. Well, I, I think it's always your role to ask the questions about how things have changed, what might be new, how you might be impacted. You might notice that on some companies' sites, you know, we do not pay recruiters, right? We do not, you know, or, you know, we, uh, we never retain, you know, you should never pay a recruiter, right? I mean, so people are beginning to get ahead of some of this yeah. AI I stuff. Um, I think you absolutely should always be asking the questions. You should, uh, you know, be talking to people in your organization all the time. What are they doing? What's new? 
How does it impact them? Uh, and I think, you know, what the compliance uh, professionals bring is a different perspective to the to the problem and perhaps a, a you know resolution or a way to mitigate. Um, so sure, you should absolutely be having those conversations, but I don't I don't think implementing IT standards is the compliance officer's job. I don't think auditing how AI is working within your organization is compliance's job. Is it compliance's job to suggest that those things should be done and they're part of other departments' plans and to com have conversations about how is the best way to get go about those and to look at the results of those assessments? Absolutely. But, you know, compliance can't run the company by themselves, and the compliance program doesn't belong only to compliance. It belongs to everybody. Everybody has to be part of the program. Mike, what would you say here? Yeah. I think you're you're absolutely right, Matt, in the sense that it's not the compliance function to, or primary focus, certainly, uh, different programs will be organized differently, to be worried about how the company will be defrauded um, when it's purely in the victim role. The, the wrinkle here, though, is what they're talking about, I think, is employees defrauding the company in order to create a slush fund. Like, did somebody create a false invoice like is there is there some way in which the company can become a compliance perpetrator as a result of these breakdowns in in controls using ai that's that's really what they're what they're focused on not on just did you lose money but did outsiders or 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 employees either independently or in collusion with one another break down your controls in order to carry out some fraud which you didn't condone in any way but you're nonetheless responsible for because they were your employees and they were arguably in, in furtherance of their of their duties. That's the way, you know, most, for example, FCPA frauds happen is collusion between a reseller and a and yep. an employee or maybe an employee acting by himself figures out a way to overcome the company's controls, break out some cash, and then use it for improper purposes. I think that's the angle they're talking about here. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is probably a little bit crude, but part of how I think of it is the G DOJ generally defines and enforces outcomes. And the way we build our program and adhere to these guidelines may help us avoid ending up in a bad outcome or at least explain how we were kind of doing best practices or doing something reasonable to avoid that. Uh, but ultimately, you know, if something bad happens, right, some fraud happens, some employees use their station at our company to commit fraud, maybe facilitated by AI, uh, it may not be, uh, you know, we may not be the only ones who are solely responsible for preventing it, uh, but it's certainly something that I think we would benefit by, to think about and make sure that we're making reasonable efforts to, uh, you know, understand, monitor, and prevent. So this this is where I get kind of lost in the weeds of this issue is that really for this to work, you're going to need the internal audit or anti-fraud people or internal control team of some kind who actually think about do these controls exist? Do they work? You're going to need probably the IT or cybersecurity people to also be thinking about it because uh, they manage these IT systems. You're going to need to think about the first line of defense that is actually doing the job of the company. And if you make the job too hard, they're going to short circuit whatever controls you put in place. So there's so many parts that are going to have to work together as a team to figure this out. And that's true whether it's fraud that might be happening within the company that could be a crime. It's true whether it's going to be fraudsters out there attacking your company and you want to put up better defenses. Uh, to com Ellen's point that compliance does not run the company. We should all be so lucky because, of course, then everything would be awesome. But you are going to need a team approach. And it gets back to does senior management support thinking about and talking about these things with the right sort of substance and oomph? Because that's how you see that you take a culture of compliance seriously. Um, we have five more minutes. The last thing I wanted to squeak in, if we could, was... Uh, access to data, which was the other yeah. big thing that was talked about a lot here. Um, I guess, you know, maybe very briefly, if we could, you could each talk about what stood out for you or what challenges do you think compliance officers have with getting access to data? Um, because clearly it's going to be important, but it's not necessarily easy. So I'll just go down the line again with 
Ellen and then Mike and then Gio, maybe like a minute each. What what do you think of this? Well, I, I think you should embrace um, obtaining data and data analytics wholeheartedly. But I think the problem is uh, kind of a chicken and the egg issue. You don't really know what data you need because you're not sure what it's going to tell you. And for data analytics, you want it to give you insights, right? Help you identify outliers or tell a story. And you don't know what that story necessarily is. So I think that that's one of the great um, impediments is you need to build a data analytic program, but you really don't know what it should be, what it would look like, what kind of data you need for that. So the place to start is to look at other departments' data analytic programs and see what they've built. Maybe they've got information already there that can help influence what you're going to do or give you the insights you might be looking for. And then you've really got to think carefully about the design because the business folks are not going to be terribly uh, welcoming if you keep just asking for data and asking for data and asking for data. So you've got to define your purpose. What do you want to find? An easy place to start, quite frankly, Matt, is, is a, you know, expense reimbursement fraud, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's always odd when it's even, right? I mean, there are things that we know we can look for utilizing data analytics to help us find the outliers. Mike, what would you say? Yeah, this is a maybe a usual lament I have. I, I, I think there is an overemphasis on data analytics, um, not because being data driven is not critical. What what I liked about the the changes is there was a modification of one of the statements to say you should be using data to assess the effectiveness of your controls. That's that's really helpful because it focuses on this theme I've been driving that you need to be able to show evidence that you've been diligent in, in monitoring the effectiveness of what you're doing and you had a good faith reason to believe it was working. What I don't like about the data analytics story is it, and aided by vendors who in God bless them, are hyping every utterance from the department about data analytics. You don't need a team of data scientists. You don't need a bunch of expensive software packages to be effective in this area. And I think there's a bit of a dissonance in, in how we're talking about this. Glenn Leon, the head of the fraud section, a couple of years ago at the ACI FCPA conference in his comments gave a very good level set on this. Like he kind of pushed back on this notion that you need this, that data analytics equals complex algorithms to identify anomalous transactions from multivariate analysis. Like, he's mm -hmm. like, just pull, as you said earlier in the conversation, pull a spreadsheet, use the sorting capability. Who are the top you know, claimants of T and E? Does this make sense? Um, pull your spending reports like which things were supposed to receive prior approval compare the people who took place in that activity with your requests for approval that you've granted and find out like hey were they were they following the policy there are a lot of what i would call low-tech ways to be very data driven to use data to assess the effectiveness of what you're doing that don't require expensive consulting firms data scientists software packages and to the extent we, the, the ECCP in this notion talks about that, I think it it betrays a big company bias. And this these, this guidance should work for all companies. And the question about is your data analytics capacity as sophisticated as the marketing teams? I'm sorry, that's a bad question. That is not that that is a bad question. Like that that is this company is 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 not oriented around the compliance um, analytics program it is critical in finding customers and what they want and and find like that is a that is a red herring and it's an example of how these are considerations if the answer to that is no then you should have confidence that the answer is no of course it isn't like but we have what we need and we've figured out thoughtful ways to achieve what we need don't don't be hyped uh in, in this area 
I, I mean, I would agree that uh, if you have access to the data and you know what you want to do with it, you know, some people will denounce this as heretics, but Excel spreadsheets can get you a fair bit of where you want to go with just that. Um, Geo, uh, I'll give you the last word here if you want to wrap anything up. This has been a great hour. We've covered a lot of material. I mean, more than a lot of material, a ton of stuff. So um, I don't know if you want to wrap it up, but Mike Ward and Ellen Hunt, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks for joining thank us, guys. Just a couple things. Uh, first, quick update on Nick. We all love Nick. He had a uh, doctor's appointment today, got an x-ray. He's on the path to healing. Great answer from the doc. Shout out to his ortho surge. Um, and on this, I would just encourage you guys, whether we're talking about AI or data collection or your, your non-retaliation uh, actions, you can do a lot with a little. And you can, there, there's a lot that you can do by just getting started. A mentor of mine said, hey, you only need two points to make a line. So you don't need 80 to 5,000, uh, you know, data points in your data analysis to make your team better. Start with what you have and get on that path to improving. Use the DOJ guidance not to force you in and, uh, you know, make your whole plan, but let it drive you to consider maybe putting a little bit more focus on something. Because if you're doing nothing about AI or you've never thought what, how you could leverage some data that someone's already collecting, then take a step into that and say, hey, let me see what I can do with it. Take a small step because every marathon, every long journey is step by step. Um, and make sure that you're using this to pick your head up and say, hey, maybe I can tweak a little bit um, and get on a path to getting better. That's what we're here about. Uh, that's what we're about here at the Ethics Verse. We're glad you could join us today. Join us every week uh, at noon Eastern here on the Ethics Verse. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Mike, for joining us today. Great insights, and thanks for contributing to making us smarter and better. Love your work. All right. Thank you.